This week on The Bioneers. What we try to do, creating spaces for men to be together. Creating space where we can reach in and grab the hearts of men. We got stuff that we got to work on. We got behaviors we got to challenge. It does not have to be a hostile way to be accountable. We could be very loving and very accountable at the same time. Join us for an intimate conversation among Eve Ensler, Tony Porter, and others on healing the gender wound by confronting the tyranny of masculinity on Bioneers Radio. Support for the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is provided in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms and by the generous support of listeners like you. The high watermark of the historic women's liberation movement of the 60s crested in 1972 when the U.S. Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. In coming years, it fell three states short of the two-thirds necessary for ratification. Fast forward to the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Most people expected that suspended promise to be redeemed with the election of the first-ever woman president. Instead, the clock seemed to turn back with a head-spinning clash of gender civilizations. Donald Trump's routine and unrepentant denigration of women, along with his self-described sexual predation, had shocked the nation and the world. The day after his inauguration, the Women's March on Washington exploded into the biggest single-day demonstration in American history. 750,000 women and men showed up, and nearly 4 million around the U.S. and worldwide joined in support of women's rights. Quite apart from economic and social inequality, domestic violence afflicts a third of all women globally. It's the leading cause of injury and death for women between the ages of 15 and 44. At the same time, men have higher death rates for all 15 leading causes of death than do women. Clearly, the gender wound is deep, and it badly harms both women and men. Does the liberation of women also hold the promise of liberating men? What might it look like to re-envision what it means to be a man? How do men need to change? Playwright and activist Eve Ensler believes changing men will change everything. In this half hour, we sit in on a deeply authentic and vulnerable dialogue at the Bioneers Conference among Eve Ensler and three men working to change men and change the story. Tony Porter, co-founder of the National Violence Prevention Organization, A Call to Men, indigenous activist Dallas Goldtooth, and George Lipsitz, chairman of the board of the African American Policy Forum. This is Breaking the Male Code, the Tyranny of Masculinity. I'm Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. I think one of the central questions of this panel is why are we still here at the beginning with men after so many years of feminist liberation? And what will it take to catalyze not only men's interest in a liberatory process, but what will trigger that willingness to be equal or driving participants in that process? Eve Ensler is a Tony Award-winning playwright, performer, and activist. She's the author of many plays, including The Vagina Monologues, which has been performed in over 140 countries. She founded V-Day and One Billion Rising to end violence against women and girls. I've said over and over that I never understood how violence against women ever became a woman's issue. (laughs) We actually aren't raping ourselves. Women took this on because we first of all, are generous, but we also didn't believe men would do anything about it. Now a new time has to emerge where men make this the central issue of their lives and of our times. And I think this Trump moment, in my opinion, could be our tipping point moment. So how do we make it so? So let me begin by asking each of you, think back into your past, (laughs) what were you taught to believe a man is? Socialization starts at birth in many respects, you know, 
and is woven throughout our lives in a whole host of ways. It's happening consciously, subconsciously, you know, in all of our experiences. It's not just our parents, it's society. It's, it's coming in, in waves in every direction. Tony Porter is internationally recognized for his efforts to prevent violence against women while promoting a healthy, respectful manhood. He's an educator, social justice activist, and author of Breaking Out of the Man Box, Ending Violence Against Women. He serves as an advisor to the NFL, NBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball on domestic violence prevention and healthy manhood training. I can speak about moments in my life where it was very impactful for me. I was 19. My brother had died tragically, committed suicide. He was uh, schizophrenic. We were at the cemetery way out on Long Island. That's where he was buried. And we had stopped at the restroom preparing for the long ride back to the city. And all the women emptied out, my mom, my sisters, my aunt, they all emptied out of the limousine, and my dad and I stayed back. As soon as they got out, he burst out crying, right? And so this is a man 10 minutes ago had just buried his son. And he, he really didn't want to cry in front of me, but he knew he wasn't going to make it for the two and a half hour drive, and he definitely didn't want to cry in front of the women. And the thing that I remember the most is why he's crying He's apologizing to me for crying in front of me and actually applauding me in his own way for not crying. And uh, that's been with me ever since, this notion of men and their emotions, hiding our emotions, not showing our emotions, not giving each other permission to experience our emotions. That experience with him has been a, a driving force in my work. A similar story is, is my stepfather, who was a Vietnam vet, and it was the sound of him crying and the sound of my mother comforting him in the other room. But I wasn't allowed to be in that space, not allowed, but I could hear the sound of him crying. And it was his memories and that, that experience of Vietnam would always come forth. Dallas Goldtooth of Dakota and Diné Ancestry is the national Keep It in the Ground campaign organizer for the Indigenous Environmental Network. He's also a digital media producer and co-founder of the 1491's comedy troupe. But for me, a lot of my socialization process, I would say, was actually through the eyes and the voices of women. The stories I would hear of my mother or my aunties, all that damn man, or the sounds of violence from when my auntie and uncle would fight in the other room, and the sound of crashing furniture, the sound of her crying, the expressions of joy and happiness when we would spend time around each other. For me, it's the attachment of the voice of my mother and my aunties and their relationship to men that was the biggest influence on me as a man. To a certain extent, obviously, I gained a certain negative perception of what it meant, but then also, I gained a strong sense of empathy for the emotion that was expressed. And growing up with a culture in a, in a world that really emphasizes the essential feminine power of Mother Earth in our relations, I think that was really a guiding principle for me. It wasn't all healthy. I mean, obviously, I, from that experience and the things I saw and the trauma that I experienced, that socialization process was a struggle for me as a man. In my experience as a white male, the privileges of masculinity that taught me what masculinity is were often invisible. The expectations that my parents had of me that they didn't have of my sister, the encouragement that I got that my sister didn't got, the ways in which I could uh, read and see all kinds of images of activity and agency that in some ways I could inhabit easily because of a gender and racial identity. And so those privileges were often invisible. George Lipsitz is an award-winning scholar and professor of black studies and sociology at UC Santa Barbara. 
He's board chair of the African American Policy Forum, which was developed as part of an ongoing effort to promote women's rights in relation to the movement for racial justice. But the prohibitions were very, very visible because toxic masculinity means you could never be masculine enough. And that's part of the pathology of it, I think, in, in many ways. And so in my immediate experience with uh, my family, my friends, uh, the larger world, the worst thing you could be would be to be gay, to be a sissy. And you, you, you constantly have to work against that. And the second worst thing you could be would be to be like a girl or to be like a woman. And so you learn what you are by what you're told not to be. And this, of course, creates a certain kind of masquerade because you're, you're putting on a you that's not you and you're performing a certain kind of identity not so much out of the massive privileges you have, but as a sense of feeling incredibly threatened, uh, inadequate, unable to deal with these things the way that you're supposed to. And in the very normative nuclear family in which I was raised, domesticity, the realm of women, came to look like a realm of conformity, of a knuckling under, of lack of imagination, of obedience. So I and, and my friends could imagine that freedom from that was getting away from domesticity, getting away from women. And so we were taught a contempt and I think a hatred of our mothers, not knowing that our mothers had been intelligent women whose choices were deeply constrained and therefore they put everything into families they resented. And when we saw those resentments, uh, we blamed them because we didn't see the bigger structure. And that's the final part of this, that you've asked us to talk from personal experiences, Dallas, talks about we're on the land of the Central Coast Miwok, that we all inherit a history of incredible violence, brutality, conquest that has everything to do with masculinity. And as the, you know, the Billie Holiday song says, if there's blood at the leaves, it's because there's blood at the root. And that's true not only for histories of nations, but it's true for individuals as well, that basically men come into the world with images of violence, brutality, of domination, of supremacy, and those things are so deeply ingrained in you, I think you don't even know that they're there. They're just the air that you breathe. George Lipsitz. When We Return, How to Escape the Man Box, How Men Can Change, and Why Women Have to Know More About Men Than Men Do. This is Breaking the Male Code, The Tyranny of Masculinity. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, Revolution from the heart of nature. If you love Bioneers Radio, it's free and easy to support us. Just take a moment to post a review on our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our show online. You'll be helping other people find and enjoy these incredible thinkers and storytellers. And thank you for helping us out. Now back to the discussion, moderated by Eve Ensler. One of the things I thought a lot about is what you talk a lot about, the man box. You know, there's a man code. Men are told to behave in groups and tribes and where the pressure of being a man, right, how you're supposed to behave is very hard to break out of. Men need support, right? So I'd like to just talk a little bit about the framework of the man box like how you each deal with situations where the dominant male energy and, and to be accepted and to be one of is pushing you one way and your instincts know you have to go another way and what that's all about. Tony Porter. Yeah, so when we talk about this man box, we're, we're talking about the collective socialization of manhood. So much of how we're taught what it means to be a man. Men are tough, men are strong, men are aggressive, men are dominating. We have feelings, but we don't talk about feelings. We don't share feelings with the exception of anger. We don't do weakness. And all of that we see as women, which is always very interesting because when you talk about strength, men are strong, we're really just talking about muscles at the end of the day. Because, you know, I, <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, I've heard every man on this stage already mentioned that it was the strength in women that's created the men of integrity that Got they it. are, you know? It. It, it, and, and we can all give a testimony. So we, we have this box, and this box teaches us as men 
to distance ourselves from the experience of women and girls in defining what it means to be a man. To effectively distance ourselves, we have to develop a lack of interest. See, yeah. you can't be interested and distance yourself at the same time, right? Then our boys get to a certain age where we give them permission to be interested, and that's usually just in sexual conquest. It's not in relationships because that's too much interest, right? It's not about what she thinks, how she feels, what she knows, what I can learn from her, her world, her humanity. No, it's about sexual conquest. There's another piece about interest. We live in the United States of America, you know, that's, that's built on group oppression. This country of ours is, is a construct, and it's a purposeful construct. And, and, and the fabric of its design is really identifying and solidifying legitimate access to resources for those who this construct was designed for. We're talking about white folks, right? White folks in the United States for America, it is not required for them to have an interest in the experience of people of color for their own survival. Their survival is not based on that, right? So if they have an interest in the experience of people of color, it's because they choose to. While people of color have to have an investment in the experience of white folks. So much of our survival is understanding white folks in this construct called the United States of America. And the same way with women. Women understand men in a much more in-depth way than men understand women. You know? Now, we as men have given that names, you know what I mean? We find inappropriate names to define that. She knows me, she's always in my business, push my button, but oh, you know, we got all kinds of things we say. But the truth of the matter is, her survival requires that she understands men. And it makes sense that this topic that we're here to talk about is about the male code, and there's more women in here than men, right? If we were talking about white supremacy, there'd be more black and brown people in here by and large than white folks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If we was talking about challenging heterosexism, well, you would expect that the room to be full of heterosexist people, right? No, that they would be more probably gay, lesbian, bi, trans, gender non-conforming folks would be here front and center. One of the questions we were, we're gonna get to is the kind of learned objectification of women. Right? It comes into you early so that it's so programmed into you that what then begins to turn you on, literally, is that objectification. And I think, to me, that unweaving, that untangling is so core and critical. So maybe you could also weave that into what you were going to say. And anyone can start. Tony Porter, why don't you jump in? And a lot of it is not just necessarily about objectification. That sounds just too abstract for me. When we're objectifying women, looking at women, I'd rather say we're looking at body parts. Then that helps me to really understand is, you know, is, is more than objectification, it's dehumanizing. You know, because they're not people then, they're, you know what I mean? I'm not saying it's like I got it all together, I do it. Maybe the difference for we as men up here is we do it and we say stop doing that. Yeah. We'll challenge ourselves where other men might be on remote control and that's where that dehumanization really gets the playground. Wow. So something I know about all of you is that you changed. So I know there's not one particular moment, but I really want to know because I think it's so critical to talk about what happened to you that got you to be a different kind of man, that got you on the journey to understand that the way it was set up wasn't the way to go. Dallas Goldtooth. I was in 11th grade, and my mom handed me a book. The book is called Wounded Warriors. 18 different stories of survivors, of those that have gone through trauma, childhood trauma, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and she was in it. And she sat us all down and said, I want to give you guys this book. What's in here is what I have in here every day of my life. And I want you to read it. And it was a painful story, you know, a lot of trauma. I read that and I come to her and I was crying. And who I read in that story, had I not known my mother, 
the sum of all those parts of that story didn't match with this beautiful, strong woman in front of me that was entirely positive looking ahead. And I carried that with me. That, that was like a significant shift in my entire perception because at the core of that story was trauma and pain inflicted by men, by my grandfather, by uh, uncles, by people that loved and cared, that were supposed to love and care. It forced me to re-examine how I relate to other men and my female relatives. I went to UC Berkeley, I went to Cal. Automatically, when I step into a room and there's a lot of other organizers, people of color, and a lot of women of color, I would do this thing where I'd be like super exaggerated nice. Something in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm a big man and I automatically know that I could be a trigger. Just walking into the room, I automatically be like, hey, how's it going? Like super goofy, weird. And that's what people knew me as. Oh, that's a weird, goofy Indian guy. <laughs> and it took me a while to really process like where that was coming from because I was so self-conscious about how I interacted with my female relatives and to where I carried that with me. And, and I really go back to the story of my mother who was never afraid, who was, well, I'm sure she was afraid and terrified to pass that on to her children. But for her, that was like one of the give it, greatest gifts that she could give was saying, read this because this is who I am even to this day. Wow. Well, I, I just want to say, I don't know about all of you, but I've rarely been in a conversation like this. Is that, do we all agree? Yeah. And, and I think in many ways, what we need to do is have these conversations and create context like this where men can tell the truth because it's really hard for men to tell the truth, living in patriarchy. I think there's a grief in men that women feel all the time. I know with my own father who was a perpetrator, I woke up every day living in his melancholy. You know, I was swimming in his melancholy. So I think what I'd really like to hear from each of you is what do we do with men's grief? How do we treat it? How do we look at it? How do we bring it up? And how do we heal it? George Lipsitz. Well, let's stipulate that there are things about men that we can neither explain nor defend. Uh, <laughs> but I think you're onto a very important part of it, and that is when we talk about privilege, uh, we sometimes imagine that the privileged have easy lives and uh, are, are just sitting around chuckling over all that they have. And yet, privilege is created in such a way that you can never be satisfied. You always feel injured. And you know, you're talking about your, your father's sense of grieving. In Latino music, the bolero is often a man's complaint about being abandoned by women. It, it's a trope that happens over and over again. You hear it in US country music. You hear it in the blues. A uh, deep sense of betrayal by people who themselves brag about their own betrayals. You know, there's something about this in which the wounded male self is even more dangerous than the triumphant and victorious male because they want endless recompense and reparations for the suffering that they imagine that they've had and no victory will ever be great enough. This is where we need a mix of inside and outside. But if you don't change the broader organizations of power and opportunity, then these things aren't going to change. And so part of what men need are successful women who outperform them at work because the shackles of sexism are taken off. Part of what men need is to go to schools where affirmative action is routinely enforced and so that the smartest person in the class, even if it's a she, gets to show that they're the smartest person in the class. We need to have a society that stops squandering the talents and abilities and the productivity of women for the vanity of men. And so the rearrangement of, of things, even at the point of wages and the, and the point of production are, are important. But we also just need a new social charter in which we have a different understanding of what these relations are. Tony Porter. What we try to do, and it leans into what you were sharing, Eve, is creating space. Creating spaces for men to be together. Creating space for men to be authentic. Creating space where we can reach in and grab the hearts of men. You know, it's not about letting you off the hook. We got stuff that we got to work on. We got behaviors we got to challenge. It does not have to be a hostile way to be accountable 
we could be very loving and very accountable at the same time. Beautiful. Yeah. Tony Porter, George Lipsitz, Dallas Goldtooth, and Eve Ensler. Breaking the Mail Code, The Tyranny of Masculinity. You can see and hear more from the guests in this program and explore more Bioneers radio programs, podcasts, and videos online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Osabel. Written by Kenny Osabel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Program engineer, Emily Harris. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest People of Cameroon and Baca Beyond from the album East to West. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest People through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Sounds True at soundstrue.com and by Growing Bin Records at growingbinrecords.com. For more music information, please visit bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0317. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley's pasture-raised organic dairy products, bringing the good from our family farmers to your table at organicvalley.coop and by the generous support of listeners like you.